so yeah, hi everyone. Um, for those who don't know me, I've been working for a long time with CC, the Netherlands, here in Australia. And only about a year and a half ago, I left academia, but I'm still around academia, to be honest. So collaborating with university and mostly doing consultancy work. Um, so today I'm going to discuss about challenges in 3D data integration of digital twin. So mostly talking about a project that we did here uh, and a few projects we implemented while I was here and some new updates. Um, I'll be a bit quicker because that we don't have much time, but mm -hmm. spatial digital twin, 2D, 3D, GIS integration, beam integration, and uh, the summary challenges and solutions as requested by CC. Mm -hmm. All right, so with all the presentation we've had today, we already have a clear idea of what a spatial digital twin is. Um, I just wanted to emphasize a bit more on some aspects that were really the drivers to our vision of what, digital, what the digital twin is. Um, and uh, for us, and I by us, I mean the research group I used to be uh, in here, uh, we are a spatial data driven so we are really talking about this spatial data playing a foundational role in the digital twin um so the spatial data is one thing but um you have to interact with this data and you, it has to be interoperable to some extent so that you can bring them together uh and for that the standard data model plays a critical role um also, in terms of storing the information, um, we think that using a database is really the way to go because file base is not sustainable. Uh, sustainable in the sense that it can lead to several problems in general. So a database is really a more federated way of going. Um, also, we cannot really talk about a digital twin without having some dynamic components. So IoT sensors are definitely critical. Otherwise, it's just a 3D model of a city, basically, or a 3D urban model. And finally, the inter interact uh, the interaction aspect is also very critical. So um, you need an interface that is friendly enough to be uh, for the data to be interacted with. So these were the key drivers of whatever we are doing in the direction of a digital twin. But of course. Uh, a very critical step into all of that is the data integration. Data integration is just conceptually taking a lot of data that may be different, bringing them together and providing a sort of unified view of that. Um, but yeah, so if we come back to the case of spatial digital twin, how do we do that? Uh, what type of data do we have? So in this, in one specific project that I had mentioned, this uh, livable city digital twin project, so this is a data set that we ended up with. So we had some 3D buildings, we had some road and railways, 2D, have some water bodies, 2D as well. We had some DEM, so elevation, so can say it's 3D, so or two and a half feet. And then we had some IoT sensor. So all of these are good ingredients to build a spatial digital twin. Um, but of course they are different. Uh, so you need to bring them together. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the one of the best ways, at least that we know, to bring data together is standard. Um, so we went on and tried to implement a CTGML version of the integration of all those standards. And uh, as you can see, the CTGML itself has already some, all the notion of this data that were mentioned. So we have the building, have the roads, the water bodies, vegetation, etc. And whoever has worked with developing, a, in a, have been involved in developing a standard, you will know that it's really taking a lot of time and a lot of effort, a lot of brains coming together, trying really to figure out all kinds of cases. So once something is published in that perspective, I think it's really, it's really valuable and should be used. CTGML is one of those. It's been around for several years now and uh, it's getting really stronger and stronger. So we tried an implementation of CTGML for the architecture. So this is the name of the project. There is a link at the bottom of the live demo that you can you can play with any time. Um, so the, the main workflow was we had the spatial data and the CTGML implementation combined with a database leads us to 3D CTDB. 
Um, and on top of that, we have the layer of post GIS, obviously. And then the IoT data are brought on the side and the interface for visualization is CGM or QGIS. So a pretty much GIS driven uh, uh, digital twin implementation. So uh, among the challenges, of course, I said different data. So you have different attributes. Um, you have uh, different information, but they represent different schemas. And you have to bring all of that together in that in that CTGML database, so C3D, CTDB. So uh, an important part of the work, which was very manual work, was to really try to tweak those data so that they can or first to identify how much they map with the, the CTGML schema and try to integrate them to the CTGML schema so that everything is CTGML. Uh, that was a heavy process, and that took quite uh, probably most of the time in this project. Um, and apart from that, the 2D data also, we wanted to bring them 3D because we are talking about the 3D spatial data, the 3D digital tree. Um, so we did that using the DEM. So these are roads, these are uh, water bodies. So these are like 2D, but on the terrain. So if you had the terrain information, you can bring them to 3D to some extent. So this is a process that we did. Uh, and the terrain itself, we generated um, a full terrain from the DEM, which is a, a vector version of the, the raster DEM, so, which is a triangulated regular network. So at some point, we, we had this uh, the roads, the buildings, the water bodies, uh, and everything in 3D. Uh, so, so from there, we could visualize them on Cesium and QGIS. So for Cesium, we had to implement our kind of our own way of bringing the data to the viewer because there is no native um, connection to at, at least two years ago. There was no native connection to a, a post GIS. Uh, so we had to implement something ad hoc. Um, but QGIS is straight away. So you just connect the database and you can see the data. So we have these two viewer. Currently, this link at the bottom is is based on the Cesium, Cesium, uh, viewer, Cesium view of the project. Um, and bringing all this data together, we were able to process, to perform some interesting analysis. Uh, so for example, there is a one, one very critical operation in that project, which was about computing shadow polygons. So we wanted to keep the polygon in a, to store the polygons of the shadow so that they can be used rather than performing direct casting. So for example, QGIS doesn't have shadow casting specifically, uh, but with the shadow polygon, you can bring them in QGIS. So this animation is on QGIS. Um, and you can, of course, from there perform a lot of operation, mostly shadow based, but also urban hit islands. So analyzing this Landsat data set, um, because the purpose of that project was livability. So, and one in the city that was uh, as being assessed is the city of Liverpool in New South Wales, and they are subject to urban hit islands. Uh, so this heat and how the heat is behaving around the city was critical to them. Hence the hence the 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 focus of this application on shadow and heat related issues, um, and then the city had several IoT sensors that were brought. I mean, you can access to them. It's open data, but it's through some dashboards, some graphs, etc. So we just connected to those sensors and brought them in the map. Um, one part of it is just visualizing the people counting, car counting or bicycle counting. And also we brought in some CCTV views. We mimicked the CCTV views on the 3D model and added on top of that some layers that gives some color coding to say if the road is if the traffic is high, for example, it will be red. Because of course it's not like this was on Cesium. We, don't, we didn't have this uh, kind of animation like we saw earlier today of a buses, et cetera. But just some simple color coding to give some information to the councils. All right, so uh, going a bit further in that project, we didn't have BIM model, unfortunately, to deal with. But of course, integrating BIM model is a big challenge as well for 3D digital twin and uh, urban digital twin in general. 
because as we, as, as we have seen already with several presentations, it's very valuable in terms of data, has really a lot of information in it. Uh, these are some examples of this very campus uh, that we are sitting in, uh, this building that we are sitting in here, and even another version of that, uh, only the spaces to visualize some sensors that are here in this building. Uh, so we've done some work bringing the beam as is in the model. However, uh, we know by experience that BIM are really complex. They are not really designed for GIS environment because they are designed for, um, let's say, at a project scale. It's very detailed, but GIS is city scale. So you cannot have that much detail for every building of your model. It's not going to hold. Or you're going to struggle to maintain them or to store them, etc. Uh, and there are also other aspects of that too, privacy issues. So we cannot just have the full model of a building available on the web so that everybody can access to it. Uh, people don't necessarily want, mostly on private spaces, you don't want your own room to be just out of being, I mean, open in Google Map, for example. So yeah, so because of all of all those issues, one approach to solve that is a simplification of the model simplification by simplification we mean being able just to strip out all the information that are inside a building and stay with the check the envelope because that's the public part of a building so you can safely publish the shell of a building and that's what the mapping and map, mapping agencies are doing anyway um but this is a tricky process too so this beam shell that up is a project that I have been working on on the side and because I've been really dealing with BIM model for a long time and that is aiming to subtract this shell automatically from a BIM model. This is a website, this is a software as a service, you can try it for free. Uh, if you have some BIM model, drop it there. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, please just give me some feedback because there are really some challenging BIM model out there. Uh, but anyway, um, in summary, in terms of challenges, of course, integration, you have you are dealing with heterogeneous data. There are so many types of data available everywhere, um, describing generally the same objects, and we want to bring them together to do something with that. So this integration, you will face some different sources, different schemas, different semantics, and you need to bring them together, and it's time consuming. So you may want to rely on metadata, but metadata is also a tricky space. So all the data that we had in this digital trend project, the metadata were not really reliable because a lot of missing information or not up to date. Um, on the other hand, there is a lot of 2D data that is available. It's not because we are going 3D that we need to, we will throw them away. They are very valuable. So we need to find ways to keep them in the loop and do something with them. Um, earlier this morning, Brenton from the uh, Live News as well mentioned this lack of source of truth. So this is the issue that comes all the time. Whoever is dealing with some sort of integrated system will complain about lack of source of truth. You never know if the data that you have is the most up to date or is the most valid one because there are thousands of other versions around and you may not even know where to find those versions. So this is a big problem. Uh, and finally, BIM, very valuable, but still hard to deal with. So these are the main challenges that, at least in my experience, I've been facing on and on when dealing with 3D um, data integration. Solution to them can be really straightforward. So the first one, I will say standardization. Dealing with standard will help um, the data integration for sure. But dealing with standards mean that everybody is working with some standardized data to some extent. And then also those different standards needs not, we don't need a standard to bring together the standards because it's gonna be an uh, infinite loop, but um, it's easier to work with standards and bring together standards than non-standardized data. Um, and for the existing data that are 2D and the other are 3D or in the other uh, dimensions, we need to look into combining, linking, upgrading, and updating all this data.
but not throwing away. So it's really about linking them, being able to know that, okay, I'm talking about this building. It's a footprint, but I have a 3D model of that same building. I can keep together somewhere in a database, for example, uh, two different representation of the same building. And I can use them in a different scenarios. Um, so for the lack of single source of truth, it's a tricky problem because somebody has to be responsible of that source of truth. And that's the problem because being responsible means have some liability issues that are involved. If somebody relies on the data for emergency response, if it was wrong, who is liable? So it's not clear in this space who's going to stand and be this authority that's saying, I have the source of truth. You can imagine that the government can play this role to some extent, but as we mentioned this morning, you cannot have the whole all the data mm -hmm. as well. So this is really open for discussion and open for research. And finally, for the BIM data. So for this project, it has been really tough to have with BIM data because people don't want to share necessarily the BIM data. You have the architects that are really into the intellectual property. They don't want to yeah. just let their model being used. You have uh, people about their privacy. So you have the data issue. So the simplification can really bring some sort of compromise to this problem. Uh, so yeah, with that, I'm done with my presentation. So yeah, if you have any question, happy to, to answer. Yeah. You have been so many years in the now in the other side of the world. Yeah. Do you see differences between what we consider in the academia challenges and problems or what the agency considers challenges? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, definitely. So definitely, there is, there is. This is two world. Um, because the the thing with academia, and that's what why I raised this question this morning about this few digital twin that were implemented. Each project are uh, can be very advanced, uh, but in practice, people are not necessarily at that stage. So they have practical problems. Um, I mean, a solution can look nice, but the time to implement it, or it can be very disruptive. But in practice, you cannot, there are services that cannot stop, try this thing, implement it first, and then keep going. No, they have to keep going. So generally, whatever you see in projects, in research, is maybe too advanced for them, in uh, for the industry. So a small component may be of interest. It can be integrated slowly. Um, and uh, academic is, academia is really about new issues, so they can solve one problem a thousand different ways. And um, so, yeah, so what my feeling is people in the industry is already overwhelmed by all of this, so they don't necessarily understand all of it. It looks very nice. If you are able to show them really great potential, more money-wise, generally, so they are really able, they are happy to try. Uh, but there is a there is a gap. There is really a gap between academia and industry. You know, um, the bigger one maybe they can do some research, maybe very very applied research. But yeah, so I've struggled at the beginning in my discussions really to find some common ground. But uh, but yeah, there is a gap. There is there is a considerable gap. But that is that being said, I think academia and industry should always work together because. The impact is more on the industry because they are closer to the product and the to the people in general. Academia tends to be to play around, which is very important because this is where you do the concept and the foundation. But there is work that is needed. Yeah. I think so. We have a really great day and great presentation. Uh, thank on, you. Uh, or is it some that puts my actually my uh, time for me some well, right? better than the academic yeah. one. Um, in one of your slides. Uh, there was one slide where you were talking a little bit about heat waves, and I guess maybe it's a comment rather than a question, but I'll let you respond anyway. And oh, yeah, it there's really growing interest now. Yeah, it wasn't one of the slides yeah. here, either. There's really growing interest now, especially in plant protein cell first, on any research work that comparing between heat wave temperature and how it's actually affect people 
uh, as the partner that is used for public transport, mm -hmm. as well as active transport. Mm -hmm. So I I know it was only like a very small part of that slide, yeah. but it's actually a huge growing interest, and I thought it would be good to say this because there's a lot of academics here, oh, yeah. including myself, mm -hmm. time, and um, and PhD students, and I think there's much more work on that space. Yeah. Uh, and there's a really growing interest how we can improve you know, infrastructure and service, especially in that. Yeah, yeah, in that yeah. When, when we break, then it's happening. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what is good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Def I mean, definitely. So, so that's, that's what I, that's what, why I said it was really the main driver of this project. Because this, when we said livability on that place of the world, at least, and many others in Australia in general, really you are having very hot temperature in hot days. And that affects the way people behave, obviously. So they will maybe go under the shelter of a, mm. of a bus stop, not necessarily to wait for a bus, but just to have some shades. Or uh, one of the purpose of this project was also to understand how people behave exactly in those situations. Uh, do we have enough shades in the buildings or even in building permits? Do you surely allow this building to go that high? Maybe it's going to bring some shade at a given time of the year, etc. Uh, so definitely, uh, there is quite a lot of, there is, I think, some a body of work uh, and many challenges to be addressed in that space. We haven't done too much in this project, importantly, apart from bringing the data, being able to overlap with some small building and just analyzing. Um, but I think there is way more that can be done. So if some researchers are into this field, you should definitely go for it. Mm -hmm. Next one, the first was yeah. an extension of what CC was talking about. It's kind of a uh, gap between industry uh, adopting yeah. research and, yeah. and research essentially coming up with interesting concepts that should be fluid. Do you think that there's a missing piece in the middle, which is the mechanism by which they can deploy the piece of research within an active environment mm -hmm. and, and without there being this huge consumption of time and resources? Yeah, 100%. That's, this is where, basically, that's my current business, Yeah, to be honest, because I've been in this two world, yeah. basically, just being able to see how far for them it can be the, the information. We are used to go and find information uh, between academics, uh, but people out there have many problems. There are many solutions, but they, they don't know how to navigate those solutions. So um, there are a few individuals that could that can do that, but I think it's not enough. Um, unfortunately, academics are, I say unfortunately, because academics are also trying to go towards industry, but I think that has to be limited. Because if academics goes too much to industries, they forget their initial mission, right? So it's not necessarily good. And industry won't come too much to academics because they have priorities. Uh, they have really very specific goals. So we need some middle profit, of course. <laughs> of course, I mean, that makes sense. So so I, I think we need some middle medium. I don't know what it is exactly, what it could be, uh, but that's something that reduces the stretch. Otherwise, it's gonna always be like this, you know. So, um, industry is just picking up some cases that are of interest to them, maybe putting a lot of money on it, which is bringing academics to go in that direction as well, because funding is there. And then the main problem are not necessarily fun. So, maybe the government can play a role there, like just putting funding on where things should really be and kind of making it attractive for industry and academia to work together on very impactful issues, not driven by money or something, but driven by people and interests and, and benefits. But it's a difficult area too, so everybody has their own interest. All right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Really good to get this project and, um, and a really good summary of the uh, challenges and uh, solutions along the way, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um,